Hi, my name is Katherine Harris, and I'm the Project Coordinator and Chair of the California Open Educational Resources Council. This is the Reviewer's Boot Camp. I'm going to take you through several slides to demonstrate what we've been doing with the California OER Council, as well as the review apparatus for your textbook reviews. Thank you for participating with us. So the goal of the California OER Council since January 2014 has been to increase faculty adoption of high quality, affordable, or free course materials to save students money. A pretty lofty endeavor considering that we've been partially funded by the state of California as well as other private grants. A recent study found the deterrence for faculty who, uh, on adopting OER, and the largest one was not a comprehensive catalog of OER textbooks. They're too hard to find what they needed, there's not enough resources for their particular subject, and not knowing if they have permission to use or change uh, the textbooks themselves. The next factor was the important criteria for selecting teaching resources, proven efficacy. Have they been used in other courses? Trusted quality, meaning has it been peer-reviewed rigorously? And does it cover a wide range of subjects for any one particular textbook? Can it be integrated into a learning management system? And the ones that we start to scale down, a wide adoption and ease of use, uh, mapped to learning outcomes, which is things that have become more and more important for faculty to pay attention to with any textbooks, not just OER materials. Now those who are using them, the type of open educational resources that they have been using, meaning they are either open access or low cost or freely available to be remixed, perhaps under a Creative Commons license, include images, videos, video lectures and tutorials, homework exercises, which a lot of faculty have talked about ancillary materials are very important, ebooks, open textbooks, chapters from textbooks, infographics, whole courses, which we would get into the arena of uh, massive open online courses then, audio podcasts, interactive games or simulations, tests and quizzes, elements of an existing course, and then as lowest is slides and class presentations. Now this is, other question is interesting, the use of open educational resources in the next three years who adopts them more readily. You'll see that health and related and liberal arts and sciences and natural sciences are at the forefront uh, and business is also at the forefront. Education is almost overtaking everybody and then we have professional and so social sciences might consider and then in the darker ones are the ones that would will consider. Our job in the California OER Council is to significantly improve the affordability of this quality higher education for students in the state of California and across the nation. And the best thing to do that, to be able to do it, is start to bring down textbook costs, but also just start to talk to faculty about how they use and adopt OER textbooks, and then to also see how students use these materials as well. Just a little bit of background, we've been in the works since 2012, we got our complete funding by December 2013, by January 2014 nine members were assembled and we were off and running and we've just, uh, and, and we've been working through some of the things that were required by these state bills. They were assigned to state bills 1052 and state bill 1053 to create two things. State bill 1052 was uh, authorizing the creation of the council itself. 1053 was to create an open source digital library. The CSU, the California State University, was de designated as the leadership organization to manage the project. To establish the project even further, the Office of the Chancellor for the CSU was awarded grants from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation in the, the amount of 500000 initially and the Gates Foundation 500000 initially to match the state of California's funding by SB 1052 and 1053. From the legislation and the state bills itself, we have a, an outline, select 50 courses, create and administer rigorous review process, promote production, access, and use, solicit input from student associations, create an RFP to create OER materials, identify available free and open e-textbooks. 
the particular this particular council is governed by ICAS, the Intersegmental Council of Associated Senates or Academic Senates, and these are made up of faculty from the head of the academic senates from the CSU, the UCs, and the California Community Colleges, and they set a hefty group of tasks for us that range on two different slides. If you'd like to pause and take a look at them, please go ahead and do so. Uh, on the next slide is also continuing these set of tasks that we are uh, been tasked to do in the California Open Educational Resources Council. You'll notice that we get all the way down to number 11 and we continue to grow this list and it will grow according to the California OER web pages too. You can check back there to see what's going on, also our Facebook page. The structure of the project goes through the project coordinator, the nine different people on the council itself, oversight is through ICAS and the project investigator, Jer Jerry Hanley from the CSU Chancellor's Office. And then with funding comes from the State of California, the Hewlett Foundation and the Gates Foundation. The membership formed in January 2014 consisted of three members from the California Community Colleges, three members from the UCs, and three members from the California State Universities. These, they serve a one-year appointment with a possibility to either step off after that one year or cycle over to somebody else. To check the current membership, please go check out our California OER Council website, which I'll send you to in just a moment. We had specific deliverables the Hewlett Foundation wrote into the grant as well as what ICAS and the state bills wrote into it. Starting in March 2014, we had just to basically begin. We started in January thinking about what it is that we wanted to do for the year and how we could achieve the goals set out by all of the funders. We established a scope and schedule. We established policies in concert with ICAS. We complete section or phase one of the courses and approve an evaluation criteria which we did complete by the end of summer 2014. Communication plans are developed including how are we going to speak to students and also how are we going to include Cool for Ed or the library itself. By April 2014 we had created a survey for all students and faculty and we're still collecting data and survey responses from those and I'll, I'll send you over to the student survey a little bit later if you can send it over to your students that would be great. We needed faculty review panels established for these first five courses and we utilized Google Docs and Google Forms survey in order to identify these faculty who were then tasked to review at least three textbooks for us in a beta testing program through the summer. May to August 2014 we continued to distribute the surveys and we also had the infrastructure created for the faculty review panels. The panelists were assembled and the reviews were completed by the end of August. September through January in 2015, the the reviews of the faculty peer uh, workflow process and results from phase one were discussed by the council members for best practices. Phase one reviews were, are at, have been added to Cool for Ed. I'll demonstrate those in a moment. Phases two through five are being established and will go through uh, starting in 2015. And October to December 2014, we continued our outreach to faculty and student organizations by giving presentations to various organizations all over the state of California. We also have in January through May a separate phases of the textbook reviews continuing and we'll continue that on to the end of fall 2015 where we will have textbooks for all 50 courses peer reviewed and available for everyone to take a look at. Some of the things that we had to do was establish things like what is a textbook for our purposes? Could we use just a, a wiki that's a collection of data for a particular class? And the council decided that for our purposes, the textbook really was a manual inst of instruction, something that was collected together that students would know how to be able to navigate according to the core structure itself. We also were looking at Creative Commons licensing and found as many OER textbooks as we could with Creative Commons licensing. There's not a, a plethora of OER textbooks under CC licensing yet. That's being worked on now, and but we are constantly evolving this. Now why does it matter to faculty to implement open educational resources textbooks? That's a question we needed answered. 
When we surveyed the faculty as of October 9, 2014, out of 48,000 faculty from all three segments, we have received 1,200 responses and a distribution of disciplines. You see that mathematics is largest as well as English, history, biology, chemistry, and psychology, and statistics. How familiar are you with the open textbooks? You'll see that 248 responded, uh, or 21 percent, that they'd never heard of them. 39 percent said, I have heard of open textbooks but never looked for any. 25 percent said they've looked at some. 6 percent have used part of it. 7 percent have used an open entire textbook. 1 percent say they don't assign textbooks, and then 1 percent is other. One of the concerns that faculty had is that what if, how do you make sure that these OER textbooks have been peer-reviewed? And how do we establish that process? So one of the things that we asked them is, what if it were? And one of 3% said it's not important, 19% say moderately, and 33% say it's very important. That then tasks us with coming up with protocols and structures for creating a rigorous peer review. When we requested reviewers at the same time that they were filling out the surveys, as of October 25th, we had 425 self-identified reviewers, and we continue to collect them as we move through the phases. The largest uh, are from English, Mathematics, Communications, and History, but we continue to ask faculty to fill out the survey and self-identify as reviewers, and then we contact them. In the peer review process, we've drawn from faculty across the community colleges, the CSU, and the UC. Ideally, we have a panel that you are working with anonymously, one from a community college, one from a CSU, and one from a UC. All of the faculty are self-identified based on their responses to the survey, and they are competitively assembled panels, meaning they're anywhere from uh, 5 to 15 to perhaps 20 who have applied to be on the panel itself. In selecting the panelists, like I said, one panelist uh, from each of the three segments, there's a balance of experience with OER materials, and there's a balance of the places in their careers. We're using lecturers and part-timers all the way up to full professors. We're looking for people who are making policy, people who are interested in OER, people who have never used OER materials but are curious about them, people who have faculty who have used OER materials and textbooks already in their classrooms. So there's a wide selection of, of faculty who are doing these reviews overall. One of the things that I want to be clear about is that these resulting reviews are public along with names and institutions of each faculty member. This allows other faculty members who are looking over the reviews to assess if it's good for their particular audience of students. And we are finding that community college faculty really want to be able to see the reviews by other community college faculty. The same with the UC and the, and the CSU faculty as well. How can you find these reviews by panelists? Well, we have a site. It's called Cool for Ed, the course showcase. You can go to the actual course. It'll be listed under the CID number, the title, Introduction to Chemistry, its general course description, and then you'll see that there's four selections, and underneath is Go to Open Textbook Peer Reviews. And now we've added a new tab to Cool for Ed, and I'm going to take you over there momentarily. Cool for Ed is the actual digital library where you can find all of these OER textbooks and then see the reviews that go with them. There's a course showcase, which is what I just showed you. There's a faculty showcase, so you can see all of the courses that ha have faculty who offer an ePortfolio. And then there's reviews in the drop down box. Perhaps let's look at Introduction to Chemistry. So with this particular CID identified course, there are three textbooks that e-textbooks that were identified. And then we have three different reviewers for each of the textbooks. When we click on that, it opens up into a PDF. And then faculty can read through the rigorous peer review itself for all of these textbooks. You can see an overall review summary subject matter, instructional design, editorial aspects, access. And then you can go through and see the actual content of it. If you need something to help you with your reviews, please feel free to look through these textbook reviews that have already been created.
The next is that we surveyed the faculty to ask them about their desire to reduce costs to students if they were to create a textbook. And at first we had said perhaps faculty will only say that it's very important, which you see that 62% do say that it's very important for them. Uh, 2% did say that it's of little importance to them. So we see um, it's very important to a lot of faculty and it's just as important for the peer review as well. Now why should it matter to students? We ask the students how much are your textbooks per semester or per quarter and we have an introduction to child development textbook that we're peer reviewing in one phase and that textbook or the two textbooks that are normally used are $197 and $209. The low cost or free open educational textbook that we have found is actually uh, doesn't cost students anything. In California Community Colleges alone, 1,121 students enroll in this course each semester. A low-cost OER alternative would save students $100, and the savings is exponential as we go across the UC and the CSU with this particular textbook. We have a criteria that we established for selecting these 50 textbooks and you can take a look at it, the highly enrolled course identification numbering system. And we looked at things like critical thinking, oral communication, quantitative reasoning, written communication. And then we also wanted to look at some requirements. It generates significant textbook savings. It's relatively consistent across textbook products. It provides opportunities for faculty to augment open textbooks. It's conducive to discipline-based pedagogies. And there's access to multiple OER textbooks for any given course. Phase one, our beta testing phase, we chose public speaking, microeconomics, U.S. history, introduction to chemistry, and introduction to statistics, and peer-reviewed textbooks for all of these. We have our next 45 courses being reviewed with all the textbooks that are associated with it over the next year. Intro to chemistry, public speaking, principles of microeconomics, U.S. history, and the list continues on. We do have these organized into phases and so that there's a balance in each phase from different disciplines and different categories of disciplines. And we also want to balance it out in terms of what are the OER textbooks that are available. You can see a list of the accompanying textbooks for all of these courses by going to the URL at the bottom. And you can, it's a work in progress, so it is a, it's a Google Doc that we're constantly working on. You'll see at least uh, anywhere from one to five textbooks and notes about that particular course, the CID descriptor, as well as the order in which these courses are all going to be reviewed and in which phase. Now when we surveyed the faculty and we sent out all of this information to everybody we possibly could, we received these responses based on their educational institutions. You see that the community colleges were most responsive as of October 9th. The four-year colleges and the universities are divided down by state college, which is 11% return rate, and university, which means the UCs, which is a 34% uh, return rate in terms of how many faculty have actually filled it out. We're working on getting that amassed further. Out of the students is problematic. It's 140 responses as of October 25th, but we've established a Facebook campaign that's reaching out to our students. And if you can send that off to your students, we would be mighty appreciative of it. Here is the URL for the student survey. If you could distribute that to any of your students, it doesn't matter what course they're in, we would get a better student feedback. With the student involvement, we have some tasks that we wanted to integrate them, and this is why we also wanted to be able to contact them through the survey. So we distributed a survey. We wanted to identify student review panelists for fall 2015, ask student panelists to assess these textbooks. We integrate the reviews into the Cool for Ed website in the same way that we did for the faculty peer reviews. And the student review panels would be assembled each year to assess, update, or retire a textbook so that we can keep track of the sustainability of a particular textbook. We'd also like to invite student representatives to upcoming meetings. Next steps on the faculty side, identify and invite faculty reviewers, complete the protocols, manage review panels, integrate reviews into the Cool for Ed website, evaluate these textbook selection, it's continuing through fall 2015, resolve student involvement issues, report to California State Senate,
and continue OER meetings through the spring and in through the fall. Create outreach and education for faculty adoption and student use of OER materials in 2015, our next steps. Let's take a look at the review apparatus itself now that you've gotten some background and you see why it is this project is so important. In preparing for the review, just keep in mind in the workload, our phase one reviewers reported back that they spent anywhere between three and ten hours on each textbook. You're not required to spend that length of time on the textbook. It depends on how much you want to drill down into the details. We also were advised by these reviewers in the beta testing phase that they wanted to be able to compare the textbooks and they advise future reviewers to be able to uh, compare these textbooks to take notes on all of them and then fill out the individual reviews for each one. We're not asking you to choose the best textbook or only one textbook. What we are asking you to do is to consider the textbooks themselves and how they are qualified to be used in the particular course that we've identified. And that brings me to the third bulletin. The CID course description, reviewers are reviewing specific tech, textbooks to accompany a specific course. Please read the course description before starting your review. You'll have access to that on your list of textbooks. Now in writing the review, each review panel for each course has your unique review apparatus in Google Forms along with a unique URL to lists of the textbooks to be reviewed. Please complete each criteria area. The written comments are not required but they've been incredibly helpful for us and for faculty who are looking at the reviews. I want to take you over momentarily to that actual Google Form. So the Google Form comes in, in the in just like you see here. You'll have access to the reviewer bootcamp video. You'll have the slides that I'm demonstrating to you here as Google Slides itself. Or if you just want a PDF of them and you want to be able to take a look at them, feel free to call that up here by using this URL. We've established this rubric based on what we found in Achieve, and we've assigned a series of points to subject matter, instructional design, editorial aspects, ease of use, and overall impression with a total possible score of 125 points. And here if you skip down, the next one that you'll see is that a URL for your textbooks itself. You'll see that there are textbooks with live links, as well as how to access all of them, the course title, and the corresponding CID course number. If you click on that, it will take you over to the description of the financial accounting in this particular case. And then it also gives you the Creative Commons licensing. Again, we attempted to find as many CC Creative Commons licensing as we possibly could, but in some instances we were not able to do that. In any event, you should have free access to all of these textbooks in order to be able to review them. If you find that you do not have access to them, please email Katherine Harris, the co uh, coordinator, immediately and I will gain you access to that. Back over at our review apparatus itself. I've given you some guidelines here as well as my contact information, a glossary, and then access to the Cool for Ed. You simply go through and fill out each one of these. You'll see that if when you don't fill it out, it says this is a required question. When you're done with your reviews, please be sure to click Submit. When you click Submit, that should send the material directly over to our database and we can take a look at it. If there's a textbook that you know about and you would like to see be reviewed, especially for this course, please do recommend uh, another OER textbook for review and we will put that in the queue to be reviewed again. So in submitting your review, just to recap that and re-emphasize it, Google Forms won't allow you to submit your review until all the required areas are complete. So if it's saying that it's not allowing you to do that, please double check back up. Unfortunately, Google Forms requires that you complete the entire review in one sitting before you submit anything. So once you submit, you won't be able to return to a, a, a review. So please keep that in mind as you write up your reviews. 
after the review and publishing it. So each review will be available on the Cool for Ed website complete with the reviewer's name and the affiliation. It'll be in PDF form or if we can move forward with technology and work quickly we will have a way to demonstrate it online. Published reviews see Cool for Ed for the existing peer reviews and I just demonstrated that one to you. For your stipend, Teresa Dykes will contact you with paperwork to be completed. It's very important that you communicate with, your, with her so we can pay your stipend on time as soon as you finish the review. Our references for today, the California OER overview, our participants, that so you can go and double check and see who's on the council itself. Double check our OER glossary. You can also take a look at the 50 courses and textbooks and see how that's evolving. You can take a look in general at the course identification number system so you can see what classes are actually there. And we also use this as highly enrolled courses according to the CID and we use that to find out which would be our best 50 highly enrolled courses to use for this project. My name is Katherine Harris and you can contact me through this Gmail address here and you can also find us on Facebook to see what our current stance is on anything from how we're doing in 2015 to where we're going with the next phases of the reviews. Thank you, and I look forward to reading your reviews. Thank you again for participating with us.